it looks like we are ready to go. So for roll call today, I am going to go alphabetically by last name. Um, so you guys will be able to see kind of where I'm at in the list. But when I call your name, if you could just let us know that you are here, remember to take yourself off mute, please, and introduce yourself and please tell us the name of the agency or organization you are with today. Um, first, I have Secretary Sam Abed. I'm here, Sam Abed, Secretary for the Department of Juvenile Services. Good to be with you. Thank you. Ulysses Archie. Ulysses Archie here from the Baltimore Gift Economy. Thank you for having me today. Thank you. All right, Senator Malcolm Augustine or a designee? President, um, Maryland General Assembly, Senator. Thank you. Debbie Badawi. Present, Maryland Chapter, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics. Thank you. All right, Secretary Carol Beatty or designee? Hi, my name is Kirsten Ramagrath. I work for the Department of Disabilities. I am sitting in for Carol Beatty. Thank you. Christina Bethel. No, okay. And Secretary David Brinkley or designee. All right. Senator Jill Carter or designee. Um, hi, my name is Beatrice I'm Wanting. I'm here for Senator Joe P. Carter. All right, thank you. And also Betsy Shikvinia here for Senator Carter. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, Heather Chapman. Good morning, Heather Chapman, United Way of Central Maryland. Great. Council Member Zeke Cohen. Uh, present, and again, thanks for having me here. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Padilla or designee. So, Mike, are you here? Good morning. Michael Demidenko from the Department of Human Services, Social Services Administration, representing Secretary Padilla. Great. Thank you. Tara Doty. All right. Elizabeth Groff. Present, uh, Town of Sykesville Councilwoman. Thank you for being, thank you for having me. Thank you. Joyce Harrison. Hi, Joyce Harrison from Kennedy Krieger Institute and Johns Hopkins. Thank you. Inga James. Inga James, President, Executive, Ex Executive Director of Hartley House in Frederick County. Thank you. I have James Hawk representing Colonel Woodrow Jones. Good morning, this is Jim Hawk, I'm here. Thank you. All right, Frank Cross. Good morning, everyone. Frank Cross, Cross Learning Group. Uh, good to be here with you again. Thank you. Sylvia Lawson, representing Superintendent Chandri. Good morning, Sylvia Lawson, State Department of Education. It's good to be here. Thank you. Jessica Latora. Good morning, Jessica Latora from Zero to Three, um, Frederick County Safe Babies Court Team Program. Delegate Robbie Lewis or a designee? All right. Jennifer Neiser. Jennifer Neiser from the Office of Child Care. Thank you. Delegate Teresa Riley or designee? Okay. Claudia Remington. Claudia Remington from the Maryland State Council on Child Abuse and Neglect. Thank you. Matila Sacker Jones. Good morning, Matila Sacker Jones from the Family Tree. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Fred Steider. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Fred Streeter here, and um, I'm a senior advisor in the Mosaic Group and retired professor of the School of Social Work. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Donacella Wilson. Good morning, Council Member Don Sella Wilson for the town of Denton, located on Maryland's beautiful Eastern Shore. Thank you. Thank you. And Delisa Worthy. Good morning, Delisa Worthy here, uh, Maryland Department of Health, Behavioral Health Administration. Great. Thank you all. Um, if I missed anyone or if you are a designee for a delegate or a secretary, um, 
please feel free to let me know if you are here. I'll also check the um, attendance in the chat box just to make sure I got everyone. Um, but that is all I have on my list. Great. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, if there's anybody that uh, needs to check in, certainly um, uh, use the chat box to uh, update Kelly so she can update the roster. Uh, I want to just uh, go ahead and move right into uh, some of our presentations. You'll remember from uh, our first meeting, um, as we were trying to uh, figure out exactly how we're going to move things forward, uh, I think we decided that we would uh, need to set some uh, kind of definitional uh, things and make sure that we're all kind of talking from the same sheet of music, so to speak. So we have lined up two uh, speakers today. Uh, one will be from Mary Rolando, uh, Lessons from Tennessee. Uh, some of the work that um, uh, she has done with the National Governors Association to address ACEs uh, and a state learning collaborative. Uh, so we'll certainly uh, welcome um, Mary to the discussion. And then after that, uh, Councilman Cohen will uh, give us uh, an update on some of the work that uh, he has been doing with the Elijah Cummings Healing City Act, uh, which is a multi-year strategy that will inform Baltimore City policies and procedures to align with trauma-informed care and best practices. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask uh, Ms. Rolando to uh, go ahead and start her presentation. Glenn, one moment. We do need to approve the minutes. I always forget the minutes. Thank you, Christina. Uh, uh, so I will take a motion to approve the uh, minutes from the last meeting. This is Frank Cross. Uh, move to approve the minutes. Uh, second, I guess. Any opposed? No? All right, they're approved. Christina helps me with uh, many of these meetings and every single time I forget the minutes. So uh, I'm sorry, Christina. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Ms. Rolando, I'll turn it over to you now. Well, um, delighted to be here. Uh, you certainly are an august body. Almost intimidating to think about trying to talk a little bit about what we accomplished in um, when you've already accomplished so much. Uh, so please do not hesitate to comment either in the chat, which I cannot see, um, and uh, recognize that after. I will um, annotate the topics that I um, talk about, that you have a bit of the content um, that might be um, worth some of your attention. But let me just start that I'm really impressed with the significance of having your commission um, established in that's something that we didn't have, we don't have in Tennessee. And I looked at the composition of the commission, and it um, prompts you to almost immediately become visible champions for this work. And one of the things that we did learn in Tennessee was that the champions, those of you who are in influential and grassroots positions, not that exclusive, certainly can advance the work um, to a uh, and um, to help to mitigate adverse childhood experiences. I think it's very uh, savvy uh, to include um, among your designees. Uh, we did something similar with our three branch institute and found that it was just invaluable to have not only the the um, uh, usual suspects who were in the process to address adversity, but also some of the novel ones that would include um, adult correction uh, and the state police, the the appointee mission are uh, certainly um, impressive group. And so I would want to um, permit all of us to have a special role, really remarkable to include um, your geriatric mental health clinician. Uh, I know that the effect of trauma can be very serious um, problems um, adults and elders. So I applaud all of that and think that you have just opportunities within the scope of your law. The mandated functions create a pattern. Um, and yet, I think what we learned very quickly was that such 
uh, paths can be a compass, but not a blueprint. Um, I encourage that you would use the mandate to the several mandates to um, think um, and act quite expansively. We have tremendous respect for and encourage um, evidence-based practice um, in all manner of uh, uh, policy and service delivery, but there certainly is a place for encouraging innovation. What we know from our own experience and from our friends at the Harvard Center for the Developing Child is that if the, there is no innovation, there is nothing then to prompt something to become evidence-based. So I hope that you will look at your opportunities there to, again, think and act expansively. I think it's also notable that there is a requirement of you as commission members to participate in training as well as then to be accountable for the efforts moving forward. But mostly what I applaud is that you are established in the law because this is the base for sustainability, um, which is a crucial element in culture change. Uh, the matter is this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. One doesn't snap her fingers and have um, trauma-informed culture all at one time, as you know. So one of the things that I was asked to talk about is the learnings that we had from what in Tennessee we named Building Strong Brains Tennessee. And so just by virtue of background, um, I will read our mission statement, which is that Building Strong Brains works to change the culture of Tennessee so that the state's overarching philosophy, policies, programs, and practices for children youth and young adults utilize the latest brain science to prevent and mitigate the impact of adverse childhood experiences. And so right away, I've already acknowledged the value of public-private partnerships. In Tennessee, we had a three-branch institute to whom we held ourselves accountable. And in the same way that your um, law uh, designates that there would be at least two people of some uh, rank um, in each of the state agencies to participate in your movement going forward. We too had that, again, not in law. But what we recognized very, very quickly was that to the extent that we had a public sector group that we ended up referring to as the public sector steering group, we needed to balance that with the private sector with your composition, you've already got a good um, start on that and I applaud it because the value of course of having the private sector involvement is that we know that solutions to all of these issues are at the community level. There is clearly um, a role for everyone and all agencies because there is no silver bullet in the way that we can say, we can save lives by using um, seat belts there is no single response that can be made to the matter of um, childhood trauma and adversity. And so with the nature of change agency not being linear um, and being very organic, um, then one has to start where the organization, the agency and the people are. So relative to the providers that you have involved in your network, and I'm very impressed with the the quality of the um, collaborations and the like in Maryland with the experience that I've had with you over several years now. I think that um, one of the things that you'll want to be able to identify is the extent to which organizations are um, trauma aware, trauma informed, and um, their ability, uh, our collective ability to move forward. So I would um, uh, recommend that you look at what um, your neighboring states of Pennsylvania and New Jersey have done in developing toolkits to assess um, where an organization is relative to trauma um, awareness and um, trauma informed uh, practices, because those toolkits will help you to evaluate whether or not change has occurred. And also, it's a way to applaud uh, organizations for moving forward. And with the state agencies, um, certainly encourage that there be information sharing among you about what is working well and where other things can move, be moved forward, because there is a great difference among the organizations and the agencies in their familiarity and foundation with trauma. 
um, one of the states that participated in the NGA Learning Lab that I got to help with um, is considering what they need to do with their overall um, HR onboarding process to make sure that regardless of the position that one has in any of the state agencies, that they'll have some familiarity with the potential um, deleterious effects of trauma and how that might influence not only how they view the people with whom they work, but to stop and do a self-assessment about how it is influencing their own work performance. And then, of course, the, you know, the importance of um, the concepts and the realities of diversity, equity, and inclusion are so important um, because we know that um, you know, trauma has no social, demographic, um, geographic, or economic boundaries, um, and therefore uh, it is important to have everyone at the table. We found tremendous benefit of using research-based language and training at all levels and in all domains of our activities with Building Strong Brains Tennessee. We had um, the good fortune to work with the Frameworks Institute. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the caliber of the work that they do in helping us to communicate in a variety of areas, only one of which is child development. So we took what we referred to as the two sciences approach, which was the application of communication science to brain science. And the matter is that many, many people are increasingly familiar with um, uh, brain science and brain development, but it's complicated and it's complicated. And so uh, the uh, use of research-based um, terminology and uh, storytelling uh, was really important for us to establish a common framework with which we could interact and communicate. So regardless of, and with absolute respect for all the domains and disciplines that, were, that are participating in the statewide movement in Tennessee, having a common understanding and messages about trauma and resilience was really, really important to us. And the other thing is that research demonstrates that um, faulty um, metaphors and use of them can actually undermine the adoption of transformative policies and practices. So we relied on basically two values, that of prosperity, um, prosperity of the, the future prosperity of the state depends on what it is that we do with the little ones and the young ones today. And then fairness across places, which is a value that was actually established on behalf of um, education. Um, and we thought that that ought to be generalized to all of the opportunities that we wanted to create for people. Among the metaphors um, in which everyone was uh, became familiar was uh, brain architecture. One builds a brain, it doesn't just happen um, with a black box kind of concept. I'm sure you're all familiar with that sort of thing. Uh, serve and return, resilience scale, um, and levelness. And so the short circuit of activities that we went through that were went through and are pretty intense included a, a major summit of a group similar to yours um, that uh, did get themselves educated um, about brain science and communication science and the application of them to each other. Uh, we followed that with three scientific symposia um, so that the information built on the um, uh, prior knowledge that was gained we had um, four frame labs. Frame labs were deep dives into the uh, use of the uh, communication uh, skills that we were um, uh, developing. And then uh, extensive, extensive um, uh, training, uh, uh, training for trainers. We now have about, um, I think it's over 1,800 people, maybe more, who um, have been trained and the reach is right now at about 100,000 people across the state. And among the people who were trained, and I wanna make mention of this so that you'll um, consider all of the angles of the um, opportunities that you have, is that every um, court uh, employee in the juvenile justice um, uh, court system uh, was trained. 
and it has the opportunity to renew that training on an annual basis. And so with the amount of training that we did, um, it was probably the greatest public awareness tool uh, that we had and, um, and have at this moment. And so uh, the challenge then became, well, now that we know, what do we do? And so at its most basic, of course, um, it is to empathize um, nationwide. Um, I think that there is more affinity for that notion of not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. And then the other is to lead from where one is. And I'm going to stop for just a moment um, and close the door. Thank you, I've got someone coming into the house to do something for me. Um, oh, all right. Um, reforming uh, policies and practices must be intentional. Uh, the commission specification for a statewide action plan certainly provides guidance for uh, this to be done. Uh, but again, the caution is that the process is incremental. Uh, the foundation of that common understanding among the commission members, I think, is going to be essential. So to the extent that I've gotten to be included in this level set of how one might uh, participate, um, I think that's a really, really good thing. Because one of the um, most important um, graphics that we developed extremely early in our process was um, a conceptual framework for how we expected the transformation of culture to, to, to occur. It's not easy. And this is what we referred to as the four Ps and which was acknowledged in our mission statement that we wanted to affect um, change in um, philosophy and approach, policies and funding, programs and services, professional practice. And around that, uh, you'll see on the wheel many, many of the um, domains that we uh, have included in the uh, priority activities um, and participation, learning from these sectors, as well as helping to give them tools. And so, of course, at the um, highest level of um, uh, philosophy and, and big P, if you will, would be fun and accounting for legislation. Um, among the legislation that was prompted by building strong brains was that of establishing safe baby courts in each of the child welfare uh, regions. I was glad to hear uh, that one of your members is um, with the safe baby courts. And then another um, uh, major uh, piece of legislation was that that had to do with um, school discipline policies that would recognize the effects of trauma um, and look to curb um, uh, children being displaced from the classroom. And then, of course, um, state level policies are crucial. Model programs are so important for um, setting a, a high bar. And at the same time, uh, all of these activities can be uh, integrated into ongoing processes of the various agencies like um, uh, local and community health planning, uh, grants for trauma-informed um, schools to have technical assistance and the like. And then a really um, good and effective and relatively quick approach to uh, sponsoring culture change is for specifications in requests for proposals, um, announcements of funds, contracts, and grant requirements um, to uh, have that among the criteria that uh, would uh, prompt uh, organizations and activities to be um, trauma-informed and trauma-responsive. And then um, accountability for trauma-responsive programs relies on, I think, that um, relatively old notion now from the uh, learnings of the disability communities, which is nothing about me without me. And so with all of this in mind then, uh, in our strategic planning, the strategies that um, evolved um, were relatively simple and they were um, to engage stakeholders, key leaders and communities in the process, always looking to expand the opportunity for participation in a meaningful way. 
Second, to equip providers and communities with tools and training. I think we go into this now several years later, as you have already in Maryland as well, is there some expectation for familiarity with the uh, the concepts and the tools. However, it really is important to um, continue to address ourselves to the improvements that are occurring as a function of increased knowledge and science. To connect learnings among affinity groups and to share information. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel and organizations learn from each other. And then to support the efforts with financial modes, marketing, and infrastructure. So uh, to the extent that strategic plans can become unwieldy, we did think that it made sense to uh, keep uh, it as simple as possible uh, so that uh, the uh, strategies would be adopted and promoted. We had the value of dedicated and in-kind resources, which certainly facilitated in, uh, innovation and forward movement. Um, we were surprised in the first year of our effort when then Governor Haslam um, dedicated uh, some resources in his budget for um, ACEs related activities with no greater definition of that um, in the, as requirements. And so to the extent that, um, again, forward thinking with the, uh, your uh, budget and finance representative on the commission being a participant, it's really important not only to have dedicated resources, but to acknowledge the value of what people are doing with in-kind um, in -kind activities. Uh, subsequently, after uh, several years of um, annual appropriations that were approved by the legislature, the governor recommended and the legislature approved uh, recurring dollars that have been just invaluable to keeping all of these activities going. And I will say that one of the years when we didn't have a lot of uh, resource, we did prioritize um, small projects with big budgets. And so one of our most successful um, projects in its entirety was um, to one of the more impoverished counties in Tennessee, $15,000 for um, per year. And what they did with those resources was just really quite re right, remarkable. The matter of in-kind activity is um, can be tricky um, because even to the extent that all of you are right now participating in this meeting means you're not you're not doing something else that would also be quite meaningful. And so it may be appropriate um, and beneficial uh, to think about how one drops some staff responsibilities, whether it's at the provider level or in the state agencies, to take on the new responsibilities that permit an emphasis on the trauma-focused group. Because again, the mandate of your commission is really um, quite broad and somebody's gonna have to do the work. And then uh, one cannot overstate the significance of education um, in um, addressing trauma and movement forward. We know that schools are where children are and young people. And uh, now to the extent that uh, many states, including Tennessee, are looking at the issues of um, uh, educational opportunities that are not necessarily of um, uh, uh, four-year post high school uh, degrees and what it takes for vocational um, education and uh, the like. Uh, one needs to understand what is going on in that environment as well um, because people bring their trauma experiences with them. So education continues to evolve and that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. The importance of metrics is um, obvious um, because one of the things that is asked, and in fact, your um, mandate uh, in, in close incorporates is uh, how are things going? And so one of the most in, uh, important things that happened to us after we were uh, pretty well into our experience um, in Tennessee was that the Sycamore Institute um, which is a um, highly regarded um, non-political policy um, institute, uh, published a valid study that indicated that um, the cost of ACEs in Tennessee was $5.2 billion per year, just in health costs 
and lost productivity. This was an extremely influential indi uh, indicator for um, businesses and legislators to understand that there really is a cost to, um, to trauma, to adversity, and um, as a metric, that gave us something uh, to use uh, to not be astounding, but to be realistic in our communications. And then the other is um, public awareness. The, uh, we were able to engage the University of Tennessee um, College of Social Work to do an initial assessment of the public awareness of about um, adversity and trauma um, in our, the state, and then followed up that, uh, that uh, assessment um, about two years later. And one of the things that surprised us was that in terms of public awareness, that about 50% of all those um, people who were surveyed did in fact have some um, understanding of, of ACEs and uh, trauma and the effects that it could have. Well, where some would say that's not very high, we thought it was really quite high um, in, I guess that would have been in 2016, 2017. And so when it was repeated then about two or three years later, it was had moved a little further um, into the 50% mark um, and not a lot, but still it was important for us to be able to say that we had moved the dial even slightly. But there are short-term indicators of um, progress um, and successes, which can be within project, within grant um, uh, successes, when evaluated against whether or not they're meeting their own goals. There are process metrics, the numbers of agencies and organizations who are adopting uh, trauma-informed activities. And I will say that um, you've got a leg up there with the inventory uh, that has been done um, by the uh, leadership in the uh, state who were involved in the NGA Learning Lab because the inventory of trans, tr uh, trauma responsive activities that was led by Dr. Yeo is really um, quite impressive and a good uh, springboard for other activity um, along this line. And then the near-term indicators are um, uh, would include like whether or not there's expansion or replication of some of the activities that are um, that are trauma informed. And then um, the long term indicators, of course, are uh, the results of the BRFUS and uh, YRBS um, surveys, the overall health status and quality of life measures, and of course, the um, uh, health care costs and um, employment status of, um, of individuals in your state. The limitations and challenges of addressing uh, trauma and building resilience are several. Um, it's, one of the difficulties is in reallocating existing resources to address the new knowledge and practices. I mean, change is hard. People have an investment in how they are doing things. We want to um, make sure that people um, in, at every level of an organization get good feedback about the contributions that are being made and yet to recognize that there are new ways to do things. And so um, change can be difficult and also exciting, but you know that. And then the pace and reach um, are influenced by competing pro uh, priorities. Uh, the safe baby courts are a good example. When we were establishing them in um, here in this state, one couldn't just flip a switch and say, okay, we're gonna stop all these processes that are happening in the juvenile court system and do something different. It had to be developed over time. You're not gonna stop some uh, system practices that are um, happening uh, overnight, uh, but you, you know that. Um, and then it just to, it's just to acknowledge that um, uh, change is hard and sustainability is hard. But I uh, encourage you to, you know, work the statewide action plan again with that caution that, um, you know, it's a, a compass, not a blueprint. And so uh, one of the uh, really wonderful things about Maryland um, is that you've got some tremendous things on which to build as you go forward. And I, I think that there are many of you who've been participating in this. I know only a few of you and um, appreciate uh, that uh, 
there's a real commitment to do this work. That's why you've got enabling legislation. I think also uh, Governor Hogan's executive order um, from last May about the state agencies, um, policies and programs uh, being focused on uh, trauma-informed um, uh, care models is really um, great for uh, being um, more than an initial step. That's, that's big. And then the application of the 25 million of, of the coronavirus um, emergency supplemental funding for the bounce back program is terrific. Uh, a concern of all of us is that the pandemic, of course, has created an environment uh, that you and I didn't necessarily experience as um, children, but children are experiencing it now. And so to what extent is there that common trauma that might um, have residual effects from this point on? And then I think the other thing that I wanna mention and applaud is that you've got um, existing uh, cross-system partnerships to support children and families, not the least of which is the, um, the children's cabinet. Uh, it's tremendous that, um, you know, trauma responsiveness is among the uh, priorities for, um, for the cabinet and then the, the value of your local management boards. So I, um, I wish you well. I think you've got a lot to work with and um, I'm honored. Um, to have gotten to um, speak with you uh, for a, a little bit this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rolando, for all the uh, very valuable information and um, uh, looking forward to continue to collaborate with you and uh, with the state uh, as we continue to move forward. Are there uh, any questions uh, for Mr. Rolando? I see Christina. Uh, Kristen, I think you're on mute or something. Okay, I was on mute. Sorry about there that. You Can you hear me now? Okay, so yep. hello, hello, Mary. I'm not so sure if I met you, but I've been down to Tennessee many times on this bright, on your strategy. And um, what I want to make sure we know is that did you, have you looked at the National Survey of Children's Health, which has state level data for children, youth, and families um, with ACEs, PCEs, and extensive information? And I think we did a um, data brief for you, but I just want to make sure everybody knows that we have a lot more information than just on the adult report of ACEs. So it's key that we know that. And then the other is your framework. Um, the middle was the philosophy and the, uh, you know, the mindset, let's say, and the awareness. Mm -hmm. Is that because without that, those other things can't happen? Because I almost want to put it as the bigger circle. <laughs> Is that's really nothing, none, no tactics will happen without that. And so everything being done, and, and you spoke to that. So I'm just curious what you're like, should it be flipped? <laughs> you know what I mean? That is such a smart comment. And one of the um, critiques that we were given about that graphic um, early was that the that those nesting circles needed to be reversed. That's right. And, I think uh, so and so, um, if we start with tactics, but we yeah. never get there because we're not dealing with the issues that really are driving the success yeah. of tactics first. Yeah, yeah. no, you're right. Mm -hmm. And um, one, you know, it's like the, what are those, those phrases like walk the talk or talk the walk or whatever it is. Sorry, my swell dog nutmeg just woke up from <laughs> with somebody. Yeah. Um, so uh, no, but your point's well made. And that's why the, Another label that we've put on that graphic at times has been what's essential for the transformation yeah. of culture. And again, uh, to be not too trite, it is, it's a, it's a marathon. Yeah. Um, and but there so, are real strategies and, you know, yes. the transformational leadership, what's happening in organizational trauma informed is they're saying our employees need to be trauma informed, but the leaders themselves assume they already are. And the transformational leadership piece of this is so key. That's a really great comment, too, because um, I certainly um, am not in a position to be at all critical of where you are because you've got so many. Um, everybody here is very valuable in terms of content, time and opportunity to participate. But you might want to consider um, doing something that would just be that quick quiz of what do people know and how do they know it among you? 
so that you do have some sense of who, you know, who's uh, really trauma informed and um, how to, and then how to think about how to move forward, because it's important to be able to build a foundation um, with all the respect, the mutual respect that you would have for each other. Uh, people bring different perspectives. Again, I mean, I'm really impressed that, um, that you would have somebody with, you know, geriatric mental health experience, because that certainly is going to be a different uh, domain of understanding than, um, uh, someone in another organization that doesn't have the same experience um, with uh, people interaction, like, uh, and I, now I'll have to grope for what that would be. But I mean, I'll give you an example, though, of an experience we had here. And that was when we were first exposing um, people to the concepts that we wanted to get across. One of the things that we did was we played the brain architecture game. Um, and, you know, it's available. A lot of people have experience. And the uh, one of the people who was participating um, in some of that early work and continued to do so was the, um, the chair of the um, Sheriff's Association. And he came to me later and he said that forever and always changed the way I would think about who it was, particularly when we, when we picked up a young person. And I thought, you know, that's what happens. You just keep nibbling away. Um, and again, there's room for everybody. And one has to lead from where she is by modeling, by talking about it, and by assuming that, uh, yeah, always, you know, that other people who have the best interest at heart of, you know, of your fellow citizens um, will understand that science provides really good guidance on how to uh, treat each other how to move forward, uh, and how to think about these things. Well, I know that we have a, a couple more questions coming up, um, and, and unfortunately, we need to move on to our next presentation. Uh, so I see, uh, and I don't see everybody's names, but I do see uh, Baltimore Gift Economy, uh, Frederick, and then Claudia. Well, um, Christina's asking us to do this. Let's put those into the chat, and then Christina and Kelly will grab those, and then send those on to uh, Ms. Rolando. Uh, just so that we can stay on 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 track here so um well, thank you for your time and attention yes thank you so much for uh um your time and for uh your presentation and uh, we certainly will uh, be reaching out to uh, continue collaboration so thank you uh with that let's turn to uh councilman cohen uh who's going to talk about the elijah cummings healing city act uh and the floor is yours sir uh, thank you so much, Glenn, and thank you, Mary, and just want to say I really appreciated that presentation and honored to be with you all here today. Um, and if you could put up the slideshow for us. Thank you so much. So today I'm going to be talking about some of the work that we've been doing in Baltimore, and I really want to push and provoke us to think about what it requires for systems change. Um, we know that individuals across the state of Maryland are impacted by local, state, federal government. And we know that too often government has unfortunately been a driver of trauma in our communities. And I think that it's incumbent on this commission and on all of us to figure out ways that we can really reverse that trend. Um, so with that, Anne, could you go to the first slide? So I'm going to start in February of 2019 when there was a school shooting in Frederick Douglass High School. A parent came in with a gun during school hours and shot a school staff. Um, this was an incredibly traumatizing event for the young people, for the students, for the staff, um, for the entire community. And though it did not make national news, like many school shootings tend to do, um, for the young people that was there, it, it, it was really a devastating event. And what I think was also really challenging and frustrating was that there wasn't a really robust response 
at that time. Um, a lot of the, I remember talking to teachers who felt like um, they'd just been kind of left to deal with their trauma and fear and frustration and sadness about this incident. Um, and, and there was just sort of this empty feeling, um, you know, the article says, a struggle to return to normalcy that the school community felt. Next slide, please. And so we decided to hold a hearing in the Education Youth Committee of the City Council, and it was focused on youth voices, youth violence. And a lot of the adult conversation at the time was really focused on whether school police, SROs, school resource officers should have their guns when they're walking around in schools. Um, the argument being that a good guy with a gun might have been able to prevent a bad guy with a gun from using it. Um, there was some talk about should we have more metal detectors, but when we held this hearing and when we heard from the three young people that you see in front of you, Damani, Jayana, and Brianna, they wanted nothing to do with that conversation. In fact, they said, you all are far too focused on how to better police us. What you need to be focused on is how to prevent acts of violence from happening in our lives. And they named, Mary, every single ACE adverse childhood experience in the book. They talked about their own experiences with homelessness, with a parent that was struggling with substance use disorder, um, with community violence, uh, just with the day-to-day -day experiences of being Black in a city that was one of the birthplaces of racial redlining and what that meant for them individually. And they really charged us as city leaders to invest our energy, our resources, our time in trying to solve that problem. Because for as bad as it felt to have this horrible school shooting take place in the one space for them that was supposed to feel safe, to them, that wasn't the real issue. That wasn't the elephant in the room. Um, that was a symptom of a much larger sickness that many people in, in our city are struggling with. And so their mandate for us was focus on the trauma that we as young people grow up experiencing. And for me, as a, I'm a former Baltimore City Public School teacher, and when you hear young people speak with that level of clarity and precision, um, and you know when their critique feels that spot on, it's incumbent on us to really listen and to follow up. And so I went up to the young people after the hearing and said, look, I think what you said is really profound and provocative, and let's try to figure this out together. Um, because I, I can't, you know, there, there's nothing that I'm going to be able to come up with that is going to be any better or any more meaningful than what we could produce if we work together. Next slide, please. And so we started a listening tour around the city of Baltimore. Um, we listened at City Hall, in libraries, in laundromats, in rec centers, in classrooms. We had over 200 sessions. Um, the young people helped to guide some of them. And what we really wanted to understand was what could we as Baltimore, and specifically for us as legislators, because that is ultimately my job as a city council person, is I'm the legislative branch of city government. What could we do to impact this monster that we've all seen throughout our city and state that is trauma? And we asked folks in basically every community to participate and to be part of the solution. And what we heard resoundingly was, you know, what, what is amazing about Baltimore, and, and I would assume that this is true in many of the places that um, commission members are from as well, is that while there is a lot of pain um, there is also an enormous amount of good healing work that's happening. But too often it's happening in silos and folks don't know what each other are doing. Um, communities, different communities have a hard time collaborating, whether it's physicians, educators, um, elected folks, nonprofits, everybody's kind of doing their own thing. 
and there hasn't been a real effort to um, bring folks together in a way that doesn't cancel or shut anybody out of the conversation. Um, the other thing that we heard resoundingly was, you know, where's city government in all of this? Like you all are supposed to be our elected leaders, yet too much of your, frankly, budget um, is being spent on policing. Too much of what we see you all talking about has nothing to do with the trauma that so many of us are experiencing. Um, fortunately, we now have a mayor in Brandon Scott who really does understand the interconnectedness between violence and public health. But at the time, there was this feeling that city government has been woefully absent from this conversation and that you all need to plant a flag and really lead, because that's what we elect you to do, um, on this issue. Um, and so we felt this tremendous groundswell of people who raised their hand and were like, yes, this is what Baltimore needs. We need to create a movement for healing across our city. Next slide, please. Um, and so about a year later, we held our first ever Healing City Summit. And this was an idea that some of the young people had come up with. And we started at Morgan State University, um, which is one of our city's HBCUs. And we had poetry and TED Talks and seminars and just all kinds of conversations, not just about trauma, but about resilience and healing and what we could collectively do about it from the perspective of young people. I should also say that at this time, um, we were engaging with folks like Matila and Dr. Bethel and Claudia um, to really try to understand not just like locally what the landscape looks like, but nationally as well, like what other cities are doing what. And one of the interesting things that we found as we started researching other places that are working on trauma-informed or trauma-responsive programming is that no other city in America had legislated um, this work up until that point. Um, next slide, please. And this young woman gave an incredible poem about her own experiences and then quite literally dropped the mic. Next slide, please. And so then the next day we went over to Coppin State University, which is our other historically black college and university in Baltimore. And we had a huge community resource fair where all the nonprofits that had put their hands up and said, I wanna participate, came together. Um, we had, as you see here, barbers and beauticians giving out free haircuts because one of the super interesting learnings as we went about doing this was that barbers themselves said, listen, we are healers in our communities, yet we are never recognized for it, right? Because when someone comes into the barber shop, they are vulnerable, they are willing to be honest, they're able to have a conversation. We literally put our hands on people's heads. Um, and I'll never forget this guy, Troy Stanton, who's a barber in West Baltimore saying, you know, Zeke, we touch the victims of violence and we touch the shooters. And that healing touch is so important. And so we need to be part of this healing city movement as well. Next slide, please. Um, and so then we marched a uh, big group of people with the Frederick Douglass marching band from Coppin to um, Frederick Douglass High School, which is thankfully pretty close because it was pretty cold. Next slide, please. And the same three young people who I had mentioned earlier that testified in that hearing spoke about what it was like to both um, identify and acknowledge their own trauma, but then be in this healing process of actually doing something about it and helping to write a bill, helping to write legislation and helping to get it passed um, that meant just a lot to them. Um, and again, they spoke incredibly passionately and clearly and really called on all of us to um, move the work forward. Next slide, please. And then then Mayor Jack Young um, signed our bill right there at Frederick Douglass High School. Um, right behind him, you'll see Maya Rocky Moore Cummings. Um, as folks know, 
Congressman Cummings really was a champion for this work nationally. He held the first ever congressional hearing on childhood trauma, and he called a number of us in Baltimore, and I know a number of the folks that are on this call together to say to us, like, listen, I'm not gonna be here that much longer. Um, he was quite literally dying of cancer, but I need you all to pick it up and move the work forward. And so he passed away before we were able to finish the bill. And so we amended it and renamed it in his honor. So it is the Elijah Cummings Healing City Act. Um, next slide, please. And so here's what our legislation does. It creates a task force, much like the one we now sit on, of 38 people to assist in the development of a citywide strategy toward an organizational cultural shift into a trauma responsive city government. Um, folks from educators, students, parents, a returning citizen, physicians, all that it, much like this commission has been able to get folks from a lot of different worlds, that was what we were aiming for as well. Um, it calls for training for all city agencies on trauma-informed care. Um, and then it calls for a review of all of our policies and procedures within our agencies to ensure that they are trauma-informed and equitable. Next slide, please. And so here is a shot of Mayor Scott swearing in our task force. Um, again, just a really great diversity of people. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the things our task force has been up to. Um, we have five subcommittees. One is focused on improving the relationships between community-based organizations and medical institutions, which we know have been strained throughout our city's history. Um, we're actually working with a church in Southeast Baltimore that is a almost all Latino congregation, as well as um, Hopkins to create um, trauma-informed services, medical services within the church and actually create a healthcare navigators program. Um, we have one subcommittee that's focused on policy change and are looking at um, all sorts of different policies that Baltimore could implement to improve our, the way we deal with trauma in our city. Um, we have a subcommittee that's focused on decolonizing trauma. One of the important learnings for me, and I think for us, was that you can't talk about trauma in a city like Baltimore without acknowledging race and racism and the role that segregation and inequality have played in shaping a city, um, and frankly, our state, that is deeply inequitable and where trauma is disproportionately located in communities of color. And so this group is really focused on how do we do this work in a way that centers um, the people who've experienced the most marginalization. We have a youth group. They're working on reducing youth homelessness and getting our schools of social work together. And then we also have a training group um, and I'm going to talk about our trainings in a minute, but they're in charge of helping with our trainings and evaluation. Next slide, please. Um, so we, as we designed training for the city of Baltimore, um, we wanted to make sure that our trainers were Baltimoreans. Um, we, you know, Dr. Bethel has a really good line about we are the medicine. We believe that healing has to come from within that we can't just import someone from Philadelphia or New York or DC um, to teach us how to be trauma informed. We have folks with lived expertise right here in our city. And we have some brilliant, brilliant people whose work often gets overlooked, like folks like Lawrence Brown, who's a professor at Morgan State, who coined the term the black butterfly, um, Shauna Murray Brown, who's just a brilliant practitioner um, and clinician getting her PhD, who talks a lot about decolonizing mental health. Ali and Atman Smith at the Holistic Life Foundation. A lot of folks have heard of them. They are world expert in mindfulness. Two brothers from West Baltimore who literally teach in Japan and Korea and all other different places. Um, we have Dr. Malik Mohammed, who talks about rest uh, restorative practices. Annette March Greer from Roberta's House, one of the premier grief counseling centers in not just the city, but in the country. Um, and then I do want to shout out, because she's on our commission, Dr. Tor Tara Doherty, who has really been our lead consultant and has helped us keep all of this together and has just done a absolutely phenomenal job. Next slide, please. 
Um, and so here's a quick article from the Trace. Um, the first city agency that we focused on is our library system. Um, that is because we believe libraries are have the potential to be catalytic, transformative spaces of healing. A lot of folks who have experienced trauma spend a lot of time in the library, people struggling with addiction, with homelessness, kids who just need a place to go. And so the first agency that we really wanted to go deep with was the library system. And that has been an amazing partnership so far. I will also say what has been a blessing is that Mayor Scott asked his entire cabinet to do a miniaturized version of the training. And so to Mary's previous point, it is to me critically important that leadership is fully bought in, or at least the, the you know boss of the boss of the boss, which in our case was Mayor Scott is saying, this is a priority. I want you all to do it. And he himself went through a miniaturized version of the training, thus showing some real commitment. But then we started with our library system. Next slide, please. Um, so just in thinking about how policies have shifted, um, as I mentioned, that's part of the bill. So one of the really antiquated policies that the Enoch Pratt Free Library System had was that they had a zero tolerance policy for anyone who appeared to be drunk, high, or inebriated in any form or fashion, right? Which on some level makes sense. You don't want, uh, you want libraries to feel safe for everybody, but we in 2021 know that addiction is a disease and is a mental health issue and that treating it by just kicking people out is not an appropriate or trauma-informed response to people that are sick and struggling. And so D Director Heidi Daniels, who's the head librarian, shifted that policy. And instead of kicking people out, she now is bringing in peer recovery coaches in our library to provide support, starting at the Penn North Branch, which is the heart of Sandtown, where we see a lot of substance use disorder. Um, and so folks have been there with Narcan and really just trying to help and shift and help people recover instead of us just kicking them out onto the streets. Next slide, please. Um, one thing that I think is really important is that this costs money. Um, it, it ain't free and to do it well, um, and I think Mary had mentioned this as well, we need, you need to really invest in it. So we've been really blessed that Open Society Institute gave us an initial big grant to kind of seed the work. Other foundations came on board. The mayor put $340,000 into last year's budget, and we were just able to get about 1.5 million in ARPA money. But it's really important to just name that this ain't free. And if we are serious about organizational cultural shift, that has to that comes with a price tag and our budget is our values. And so it needs to be reflected. Next slide, please. Um, just some key lessons learned. Um, as I said, this work takes funding. Um, other line, we are the medicine. Um, we got to assume that our own communities have the expertise and knowledge to heal and not just look for solutions from outside, although it is also important to not be provincial and um, hear from folks like Mary that are doing the great work, other places, um, ultimately, you know, a lot of our solutions need to, I would argue, come from within. Um, it can't just be in government. It's been really important for us that the whole Healing City movement has sustained itself, that people have continued to push and hold us accountable and that there's just this real organized effort around this work. Um, folks know that if community is not feeling it, like if they can't touch it, if it feels distant or just like very jargony or academic, um, it ain't gonna work. Uh, so community needs to see themselves reflected in this work and not just as like ha hapless victims, but as part of the solution. Um, government shifts are needed at all levels. I think we're doing that work here at the state level, but local, state, federal. Um, one of the things we found was that a lot of our agencies that I would have liked to put in my bill, I couldn't because they're actually state agencies. So like our school system, our police department, not city agencies. So when I wrote the Elijah Cummings Healing City Act, we could not name our schools or our police, which is like a huge miss. We were able to 
create MOUs and we've had support from the leaders in those organizations. But to me, it's really important that we have like a blended approach between local, state and federal. Um, it takes everybody. Our philosophy has really been, if you want to be part of healing the city, it is critically important that everybody can have a seat at the table. We're not canceling, you know, we're not, Baltimore has a way of, um, pe people get really fixated on uh, conflicts and beefs that are age old and irrelevant and often it like hinders work. We've tried to be really, really intent intentional in creating a table that is for all of us, um, still acknowledging the ways that um, oppression has shaped power in our city, but also saying like, we all gotta do this together if we're gonna do it. And then just to echo my co-presenter's point, systems change is a long game. And, you know, I'm really proud of the work that we've been able to do in a relatively short amount of time in Baltimore, but I'm also very, very, very clear that this is a marathon, not a sprint, that it is gonna take an enormous amount of sustained work and effort over many, many, many years to see the kinds of culture shift and different outcomes that I, I want to see for my city. Next slide, please. Um, finally, just wanted to leave a few provocations. Um, you know, is this something that folks in other areas would want to try to do? Um, legislation, as Mary said, I think is really helpful because it puts it in law and then it's sustainable and like, there's an impetus to have to do it, but we don't need necessarily legislation, but you do need a groundswell. Um, and then the other thing I want to leave us with is how can we build power across the state for this type of work? And I think this commission is a great example of how we're doing that. But I do think that for Maryland to really heal um, collectively, it's gonna take a lot of cross-jurisdictional work and intentionality around the Eastern shore and Baltimore city and rural and urban and suburban, like everybody working together and not in silos. Um, so again, appreciate the time. Um, honestly, really honored to get to present to you all. And thank you for having me here today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Councilman. A uh, very informative uh, presentation and uh, <clears throat> great to see all the great work that's happening up there in Baltimore. And uh, uh, certainly interested in how we uh, can all work together to support. I think we have about five minutes uh, for questions. I think I see one up. Uh, I'm sorry. I see. I see a Baltimore gift e economy. I don't. I don't know if that's the, the actual name there. Ulysses Archie from Baltimore. Yeah, there's Ulysses. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I just wanted to, you know. Um, uh, on the ground in community, I I see that you have a lot of young people involved, and I see that there's a kind of a little bit of a top heavy uh, doctor so and so in this. Uh, and there's uh, is there a bit of community uh, members that are not children or not youth that are part of uh, your your work? Yeah, absolutely. So um, again, a lot of the both trainers and pretty much our entire task force is community members and community-based organizations um, that are in the mix in some form or fashion. Um, a lot of the, you know, uh, in the previous presentation, it was mentioned um, that having someone who is specialist in, or at least just understands sort of geriatrics um, is really important. So having at least one older adult in the mix has been oh. important for us. Um, we also wrote the legislation in a way where having a returning citizen um, is a critical part of our task force and just getting a perspective from someone who has been inside the walls. Um, we do believe that young people are critically important to this work. One group that I failed to mention that helps us train is the Youth Healing Alliance. Um, which is a group of young people in Baltimore that support mental health work. Um, but, you know, I would say that I think um, if you look at our task force and our trainings, um, you know, it's, it's, it's 
Baltimoreans of every stripe and every fashion. Um, and you know, where, where we fall short in that always open to, you know, if, if you got some folks that need to be there, let me know, because always interested in how we can do better. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think the next is uh, Sherry Price. Sherry, I saw you take your hand down, but I, I don't hear you. I think you might be on mute still. Glenn Cherry um, left the meeting, so she might be having some technical issues. All right, we'll come back to Sherry. How about Jennifer Neiser? I saw Jennifer disappear as well. I promise you I'm not kicking them out of the meetings right before they can ask you, a question. Can you hear me? This is Jennifer there Neiser. Is. Yes, there you Hi, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm uh, with the Office of Child Care at the uh, Maryland State Department of Education Division of Early Childhood. And I did post in the, um, in the chat, but um, you know, a big thing for us is looking at this as a two generational approach because, you know, many parents, young parents have children that are going through the same trauma that they had gone through and healing the parent, you know, the parent is go has been through trauma. So it's very difficult for them to help a child if they've been through um, something and they are not getting the help that they need. So I know that a lot of people are doing two generational approaches for a lot of, um, you know, in a lot of different areas, but I think it's really important to think about that and child care providers. So child care providers are getting these children when they are infants. Um, at six weeks of age, they can go into a child care program, a family child care or child care centers. So I, 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 I don't know if you've thought of this and I'm, I'm sure you have because you, it seems like you really thought of everything, but um, you know, connecting with child care providers in the community could really be a start of working with the children who are still experiencing the trauma in the neighborhoods you know, that they live in. No, that's a, that's a great point. Um, thank you, Jennifer. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you're both right that this is a two generational um, thing and that we like one, one of the tensions I, I feel sometimes is people are like, well, you know, why you haven't why haven't you stopped murders? Like we're, we're still having murders in our city um, or, you know, there's still a high rate of addiction or substance use disorder and then we're having overdose deaths and kind of the the pushback that we've been able to like really try to put out there is like this is not quick hits this is not lower the murder rate by 15 percent in x amount of time like that's not what we're trying to do here it really is about how do we both improve lives now and also think about that next generation and uh, child care providers are absolutely in the mix um, in, in our work, but just a really, really, really critical piece. Um, just really quick to go back to uh, Ulysses' question, Tara, Tara texted me as well. Um, our deep dive is really about supporting parents. Um, and we're going to release an RFP pretty soon for community organizations that want to help and facilitate trainings in community as well. Um, so again, if you've got some folks that you feel like should be in the mix, please, please, please let us know. Jennifer, I want to respond in part to that as well. Um, at the state level, uh, the uh, policy change that was implemented in our Department of Human Services, which has um, under it the responsibility for um, uh, accrediting, for lack of a better term, uh, the child care centers um, and the like, is that um, all staff have to go through initial training um, about uh, trauma and resiliency and, uh, you know, basic brain development and the like. Um, and to the point of we're the healers, uh, to see themselves as, as instructors, as teachers, um, and with the empathy and sophistication that that takes, and also everyone in the um, client serving divisions who are involved with adults um, and anyone who comes in 
contact with the system also goes through the training with a periodic requirement for updating. So you're right, uh, looking yep. at the gen approach yep. is really- Yeah, we have a lot of training that we provide also to child care providers on trauma-informed care. Um, and, and we're actually um, asking for more of our trainers, our approved trainers in Maryland to to, to work with um, coming up with, um, you know, trauma-informed care practices embedded in everything that they train on. So it's not just a training on inf trauma-informed care, but trauma-informed care and equity are embedded in everything that we do and everything that we talk about with child care providers. So That's thank right. you. Yeah. Great, Jennifer. I'd love to follow up with you after the meeting as well. That would be great. See how yep. we can work together. Awesome. Well, I know that we have a, a long uh, list of uh, people that want to ask questions. Unfortunately, we're going to have to move through the agenda. So what I'd ask is, again, let's post those questions and I'll ask uh, Christina uh, and Kelly to grab those and then we can pass those along to the councilman uh, and to Mary. But I want to uh, thank both the councilman and uh, Ms. Rolando for your presentations. They have uh, definitely uh, stirred up some ideas in my mind and I'm sure it has for the rest of the uh, commission. Uh, so thank you very much. And um, we're going to go ahead and uh, move forward with the agenda, so thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is gonna be uh, Christina from our team talking about the next steps, including our next meeting and then some of the things that we need to uh, move forward on. Thank you so much, Glenn. So um, thank you everyone again for um, our presenters and for attending today. Um, we really wanted to use our first two meetings of the commission to help provide um, some grounding and some context and some additional information about how communities are already starting to do this work, but also recognize the work that has been happening in different parts of Maryland and how we can really utilize the learning and the efforts that have already started to take place to help inform and create a statewide effort. Um, so beginning in January, we really want um, the intention for our time together as a commission to begin identifying not only the commission goals, but our strategies for how we achieve those goals. Um, so some of those goals are very clearly outlined through the legislation that created the, the commission, um, but also thinking about how as a commission we move forward. What are our internal processes? Um, we had a discussion um, briefly during the first commission meeting about the creation of work groups or committees. Um, we heard how Tennessee and um, Baltimore City have utilized those, so those will be part of the, the conversation for um, the January meeting of the commission. Um, commission staff will be sending um, in advance of the January in advance of the January meeting, just some materials, some outlines for consideration, just to start the discussion. So, um, for all of our commission members, you can you can expect additional information. But that is where we want to set the intention for the January meeting, so that we can start moving through the work and the tasks that are required of of the commission. Um, also, we just have some housekeeping related items. Um, there are a few um, members of the commission that have financial disclosure statements that are still outstanding. Um, Kelly has reached out to those individuals. So thank you for those who have uh, um, completed those statements. For those who have not, um, the deadline is by end of day tomorrow, which is Friday, December 17th. If you have any questions, um, you can either reach out to Kelly and um, we can also connect you to um, appropriate staff if you do have questions. Um, also regarding the Eventbrite registration, um, for our commission members, um, commission members do not need to register through the Eventbrite. We really are utilizing the Eventbrite for members of the public um, so that we can um, ensure that we have a good attendees of interest, um, but also um, that we are creating a contact list. We know there is a lot of interest from members of the public in getting involved with the work of the commission, and there are opportunities for members of the public to participate in um, the work of the commission through work groups or committees. So um, we also want to take note through our Eventbrite registration. So again, Eventbrite registration is um, intended for members of the public um, and, and more administrative on, um, on our staff end. Um, the only other thing that I had is we, I know we have had folks um, join us um, since uh, we started the meeting and just wanted to do for, um, for the minutes, are there any representatives from Secretary Brinkley's office, Delegate Robbie Lewis's office, or Delegate Teresi, Teresa Riley's office? Okay. 
Okay, hearing none, we would just wanted to um, have that opportunity to ensure that everyone was represented on the commission for um, the meeting notes. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Christina. And uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for your time uh, and attention and uh, certainly our present presenters. I think uh, I, all the comments that I'm seeing coming in are how uh, helpful these have been. And, uh, and I think it's really going to help us set the, the groundwork moving forward. I'm looking forward to our January meeting. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll dive in to set some goals and uh, some operating procedures. Uh, as always, if you need anything uh, in the interim, please reach out um to our office uh christina or kelly or myself i uh, be happy to help uh and uh other than that i'm really excited to move things forward and uh i hope everybody has a great uh, holiday season and we'll see you uh next year thank you everybody